Thank you for joining us for this Targeted Oncology Virtual Tumor Board, which is focused on chronic lymphocytic leukemia. In today's Targeted Oncology Virtual Tumor Board presentation, my colleagues and I will review four clinical cases. We will discuss an individualized approach to treatment for each patient and will review key trial data that impacts on our decisions. I'm Dr. Anthony Mado, hematologist, oncologist, and director of the CLL program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York, New York. Today I'm joined by Dr. Shoa Ma, Associate Professor of Medicine in Hematology Oncology at the Feinberg School of Medicine at Northwestern University in Chicago, Illinois. Dr. Samir Parikh, Assistant Professor of Medicine, Consultant in the Division of Hematology at the Mayo Clinic in Rochester, Minnesota. And Dr. Nupam Patel, Assistant Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Thank you for joining us. Let's get started with our first case. So I'll start with the first case. Uh, I have a 66-year-old uh, female patient who presented with the complaints of weight loss and increasing fatigue. Uh, she has a past medical history of hypertension, which is well controlled with medication, otherwise healthy. Uh, on exam, she was found to have axillary lymphadenopathy. Her spleen is palpable four centimeters below the left costal margin. She's ill appearing um, because of fatigue, uh, so that is uh, impacting her uh, uh, daily uh, activity. And on the laboratory results, we can see that she has an elevated white cell count of 47,000. Uh, majority of those are lymphocytes, 76%. She does have anemia and forms of apenia, hemoglobin 8.7, platelet count is 115. Um, she, her LDH is slightly elevated at 250. Her beta-2 microglobulin was uh, elevated at 4.3. On the flow cytometry uh, was done because of the lymphocytosis, and it shows a monoclonal B cell population that is CD5 positive, CD20 positive, and CD23 positive. Maybe uh, you can help us to interpret the um, flow cytometry and let us know what is important for diagnosis. Sure. Uh, when we look at flow cytometry uh, and we get a population that is monoclonal and we're looking at a B cell population, which also expresses CD5, the two things that definitely come into mind are CLL and mantle cell lymphoma. And we have a couple of other markers to additionally kind of distinguish them. Uh, CD23 is probably the most classic of those. CD23 is uh, positive in CLL while it is negative in mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, and then there's other things that we can use, like the expression profile in CD20 and the expression profile in the light chains. Uh, you typically have dimmer profile expression in CD20 and the light chains, uh, whereas that's conversely true in mantle cell lymphoma. A newer marker that we use is CD200. CD200 is classically positive in CLL while negative in mantle cell lymphoma. So uh, based on what we have, this is a CLL. Can I ask a question? Do you think it's mandatory for every patient to have CCND1 translocation checked, or is that not a requirement? Um, it's not a part of the standard FISH panel in a lot of labs, but many people do use it. And I think it is helpful because you do have some atypical mantle cell cases that are out there, which may uh, carry that translocation. Yeah, so uh, in our institution, the uh, 1114 translocation is part of the CLL fish panel, and I think it's mandatory to rule out mantle cell lymphoma before we make a confirmation of diagnosis for CLL. Totally. Mm -hmm. And it's the same thing at our institution as well as uh, 1114 as a part of the standard CLL fish panel. Mm -hmm. But I also agree with what you said. There, we see many patients who have a CLL fish panel that's sort of one of the commercial lab, for example, that doesn't necessarily include that. So it's important that probably should mention in all of our cases that that's tested and, and was negative. Right, yes. definitely agree. Yeah. So we did have a fish panel done, and she does not have the 1114 translocation, but she does have a deletion 11Q. So, Nupam, um, can you tell us a bit more about how the fish panel was done and sure. what's the significance? Uh, so the that? standard uh, across the board, what you'll typically find in a CLL fish panel, you'll have about five to six different probes they usually target chromosomes 11, 12, 13, 17, and some may include chromosome 6. And then, like we mentioned just before, they may include for the translocation in mantle cell lymphoma. Uh, this patient has a deletion of 11Q, which we typically associate with a poorer prognosis. So that's what we find here. What do you find in your practice when you see a patient with 11Q? Well, I, yeah, I think it's important to... I mean, if patients are reading what's 
going on online, for example, 11Q is typically associated with a poor prognosis. But I think it's always important to frame that in the context of its poor prognosis regarding specific regimens, and that's really patients who are treated with chemoimmunotherapy. Um, you know, my general feeling is that it, it sort of mandates a little bit of a shift away from chemotherapy for these patients, but it probably has no impact on prognosis when you're treated with a novel targeted agent, a BTK inhibitor, for example, might be the best, you know, the best example. And I, I also agree with that. I think um, the context of poor prognosis needs to be understood with respect to, is this a patient who doesn't meet criteria for therapy? It's likely that maybe then this patient is likely to have faster progression of disease needing therapy. But like uh, Anthony mentioned, you know, there is now data to suggest that with ibrutinib therapy, um, this quote-unquote poor prognosis isn't really as poor as it used to be in the era of chemoimmunotherapy. So I think we have to uh, be mindful uh, as we uh, talk about prognosis on deletion 11Q patients. And, and that's true for any prognostic model. You have to keep in mind what patient population it was defined in, I think, in order to really determine whether it applies to a particular patient. Yeah, historically, all of those uh, prognostic markers are looking at the overall survival for those patients, but that was uh, mostly in the era of immunochemotherapy, so that might be changing. But I would say that a uh, patient with 11Q deletion CLL tends to have a faster pace of disease progression. They can present with more bulky adenopathy, especially abdominal adenopathy. Uh, there's probably a shorter time from the time of diagnosis until they actually receive the first treatment, so that probably still stands true but it may no longer be an important uh, um, predictor mark, predictive marker for treatment, which we're going to touch on later on. Yeah. There uh, is another important prognostic marker that we'll uh, recommend to test for. So in this case, it's the IGVH mutation status. So this patient was found to have an IGVH unmutated status. Could you comment on that? Okay. Sure. Um, so basically what we're looking for is whether the IGVH, the heavy chain, is mutated or unmutated. And that kind of refers to the, the cell of origin of the CLL, whether it has gone through the germinal center or not the germinal center. And unmutated is, again, classically as a poor prognosis because that those have not gone through the germinal center, whereas a mutated uh, is more of the better prognosis as it has gone through the germinal center. Mm -hmm. Could you comment on how the test is done and what is the cutoff for defining unmutated versus mutated? So um, in the older days, it was tougher to do because it is sequenced, and that's why uh, flow cytometrically they developed and they found some markers, CD38 and ZAP70, which have are basically a surrogate for IGVH. Uh, nowadays, it's a lot easier to do, and therefore we uh, just sequence that. Typically, when we're looking at whether it's mutated versus uh, mutated, unmutated, uh, we want to see a 2% uh, difference from the wild type. So uh, in clinical practice, do you guys do the IGVH mutation analysis for newly diagnosed patients, and what do you think is uh, helpful for? We do do it um, pretty much universally in all of our patients because I do think it does affect disease biology. I think, you know, we'll talk about it in other cases where we're using NGS for MRD, but I think having um, this data available then helps us to track disease response later on based on some of our MRD assessments that we have available. Mm -hmm. And I agree. I think um, a number of our patients uh, are previously untreated at the time when we first see them. They don't meet indications for therapy. And I think the IGVH mutation status is a very powerful indicator of the biology of the underlying disease that allows us to predict how fast their disease is likely to progress. Uh, and so we also routinely obtain it in all, all, all our patients. The one thing I'll add to whatever has been said is that uh, unlike many of the other markers that do not change over time, uh, IGVH, excuse me, that do change over time, the IGVH mutation status stays pretty constant. And so you don't have to repeat this prognostic marker over time. So if you've gotten it once, that typically stays constant over the patient's disease course. I think it's important to highlight that although we all seem to check this relatively universally in our practices, the data from registries in this country suggest only between 5 and 7% of patients ever have this tested um, before a treatment decision is made. So in practice, I think it's probably not happening as often as it should be. And the surrogates, I don't know if you want to comment on it, are probably not perfectly associated with the IGHV mutational status. And so you know, I don't think ZAP70 is a good enough surrogate in 2020 for... No, and actually a lot of labs have actually gone away from ZAP70. ZAP70 has a lot of issues with stability and even interlaboratory reproducibility. 
uh, including CD38. CD38, as mentioned before, uh, it can show varying levels of expression, uh, whereas maybe negative sometimes, whereas positive, where the IGVH is always going to give you the true um, answer. Yeah. In our for my former practice, I actually asked them to remove both ZAP70 and CD38 from the panel because I don't, I personally haven't ever seen it affect clinical decision making at this point. And I agree. I think we've also removed both of those markers. Um, you know, the most sort of the most comprehensive prognostic index, the CLL International Prognostic Index, which has its own limitations, but in that prognostic index, they used about 28 variables to try and define prognosis. And in, in that, IGVH was one of the factors that was important in a multivariate analysis, but CD38 and ZAP70 were not important. And so that's why, you know, a lot of people have moved away from checking ZAP70 and CD38 for, for that reason. There is a newer marker which has not been completely adopted by the United States, which is CD49D, uh, but that has shown uh, a better reproducibility and stability as compared to the CD38 and uh, ZAP70. Is that also a surrogate marker for IGVH uh, mutated status? It does have an association with it, but it's not truly a surrogate. We have the ability to test it, but I haven't really adopted that because I feel like most important tests are the ones that we're talking about where you would, that would have a direct influence on clinical decision making. And so, you know, the FISH does, the IGHB mutational status does. We didn't talk about it, but next generation sequencing does. Mm -hmm. CD49D, CD38, the others, I don't, I really don't know how to interpret them in, in, with the current data and make a decision based on those results.